I'm Simon Pfeffer from uh, Supranational, and uh, I helped organize this event along with Neha and Ron and Vinod from MIT. Um, thanks for all coming on short notice. It was relatively short notice. Um, we decided to host this event uh, along with the sort of time lock capsule unveiling a couple of days ago, and it seemed like a nice opportunity. People would be in the area, um, so we threw it together. I think we have a lot of good talks lined up. Um, this morning is going to be a few talks, um, a little longer, and then we'll have a break at around 11, followed by lunch, and then in the afternoon we have breakout sessions, and so you'll see what the breakout sessions are in the various rooms, so you can decide kind of where you want to go. Hopefully you come. Those are going to be pretty informal um, discussions. I want to thank um, Ashley and Sharma for helping to throw it together at the last minute here, getting food and all that stuff coordinated. Um, Along with MIT, of course, for hosting it. And I think that's about it. So let me introduce Ron. You guys have probably never heard of this guy, but he's going to say something about a time lock. And uh, welcome. Thanks, Simon. So welcome, everybody. Yes, it's great to be here. I uh, was surprised that all of this happened, actually. <laughs> um, not only the, the solving of the puzzles, but the immense interest in verifiable delay functions and, and the setting up of this conference. I, I hadn't expected that either, so it's, it's nice to see all this activity. Um, it's hard to predict where technology is going to go and what kinds of things are going to be popular two decades or you know, later after you, you, you work on something. Anyway, so what, I'm, what I've got here is a set of slides. The slides I used on Wednesday, I think some of you didn't make it on Wednesday, so I'm just going to review some of the, the basic stuff that we did back when, setting up the puzzle that got solved just recently by Simon and, and Bernard. Where's Bernard? Yeah, Bernard, Bernard, Bernard first, and then Simon and team uh, second, and then uh, Juan Pineda is also about ready to solve it too, and I don't know who else might be uh, working on it simultaneously, <laughs> but uh, Bernard, Bernard crossed the finish line first. And so he deserves the. <laughs> and also, congratulations to everybody else who was uh, Simon and team and, and uh, come on everybody. So uh, this is started off for us uh, back in '90s, and I'll talk about what we did and then the puzzle we set up and how, a little bit about how it got solved. So if you were here Wednesday, this will all be rep repetitive. Um, but uh, for the, those of you that weren't, it'll be uh, a new. I'll try to talk fast since I'm supposed to be done in 10 minutes or something. So we set up a puzzle, a time lock puzzle idea, proposal, uh, back in 96. 99, we had a party for our laboratory, which was called the Lab for Computer Science then. It's now called Computer Science and AI Lab. As part of that, we set up a time lock puzzle to be the key, the solution would be the key for opening a time capsule. We did that actually on Wednesday, the time capsule was opened. It's a big leather bag designed by Frank Gehry. Um, and, and it was, uh, I'll say a little bit about the solutions too, but you'll hear more about that, I think, coming up. So the, the question was sequential computation. Uh, this joke didn't actually go over so well, I thought, on Wednesday. I don't know. <laughs> but could, could two women have a baby in four and a half months? Maybe it's tasteless these days. I don't know. But, but um, that, that's the question. You know, can, you, can you speed, the, can parallelism speed up computation? Or more, um, re, you know, technically, can you have intrinsically sequential computations? So that was our goal back in 96, to design computations that were intrinsically sequential. They really can't be sped up using massive parallelism. So you can design a difficulty, design a puzzle, uh, not like the, the, the Bitcoin puzzles, which can be attacked using parallelism, but a puzzle which just requires a certain number of operations to solve. So you start in some state, you follow your nose, and that's the only way to get to the finish line, is to do the steps one after the other in a sequential manner. So that was our goal, and we came up with a particular proposal for that goal. There's a number of ways of doing that. Um, you could just iterate a hash function, for example. Uh, but if you have some algebra, you can get some other properties that are nice. We chose, uh, maybe not surprisingly, to base it on a modulus n that's a product of two primes. Uh, and then picked the number t, that's the number of operations, that was the design goal. And so n and t describe the puzzle. And the puzzle is to compute 2 to the 2 to the t mod n. So you can do this by repeated squarings. You start with a number 2, and every time you square that number, you double the exponent. So get 2 to the 2 to the t after t squarings. And so the solution to the puzzle is a sub t. And 
I don't know of any way to short circuit that other than by doing t squarings. I mean, maybe, well, if you know the factorization, you can short circuit it. Where's my the slide thing isn't even sequential. There we go. That's strange. Laptops misbehaving. Okay, well, um, so the goal is to, another thing you'd like to have would be to embed a message so that when the puzzle is solved, you can see a message as well as just see this random value a sub t. And these values a sub t are really random. And that's one of the purposes to which uh, these uh, uh, puzzles get uh, used for is, is uh, you know, generating random numbers. So you can use that a sub t as, as a pseudo one time pad to. XOR that with a message and get a ciphertext. And um, then when they solve the puzzle, you can get the message back. And so we did that, too. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with my laptop here. It seems to be acting very flaky. Excuse me. Let me try. Huh. PowerPoint that's misbehaving. Let me try. Well, okay. Let's, oh, you're not getting it. I always say that this is a PhD in it. Pardon? It's up now, yeah. Um, there's a PhD in somebody to get projectors to work right. <laughs> okay, same slide. Is that going to work? Okay, so we had a party in 1999. Uh, it was for the Lab for Computer Science, which started off in 63 as Project Max. So it was a 35 year party plus one year because it took us a year to organize the party. Uh, Mike Jertuzos was the director. Uh, we had an agenda with Bill Gates coming, and Chuck Vest, who's president of MIT, gave some remarks. So we had a big bash. It was the Museum of Science. Um, a lot of things happening. One of the things that happened was we had this time capsule. We wanted to uh, memorialize some of the contributions of people in the lab. So we created this leather bag, which was a time capsule designed by Frank Gehry. Um, and uh, I'll see a picture of it in a second. So the intent was that would be to, to be opened in 35 years, since it was the 35th birthday party. We'd open it in another 35 years. And so the goal uh, was to design a sequential puzzle that would take 35 years to solve. So that ended up on me to, to design a puzzle uh, that would tr nominally take 35 years to solve. And so we did the best we could at this. How do you design a 35-year puzzle in 1999, a puzzle that should take until 2034? Well, we tried, and we either failed or succeeded, depending on how much accuracy you're demanding out of the uh, whole time. So we were within a factor of two, which I think is OK for a theoretician, right? So. How did we create the 35-year puzzle? So we measured how long squarings took. This is an iterated, repeated squaring problem. So we measured, uh, or estimated, I should say, uh, 3,000 squarings a second uh, that might be possible in 1999. This was based on a number of different so sources, and, and uh, we've got some old emails that talk about some of the approaches that were used to, to make that estimate. Um, that estimate is, you know, I, I think Bernard's done some more careful studies, and he can talk about some of his uh, recreations and, and so on, too. It's not clear we had the best numbers at the time. And then, even worse, from the uncertainty of estimation, you've got Moore's Law coming into play. Moore's Law was still alive and well in 1999 and was predicted to be alive and well for another you know, 13 years at least. So we had to predict how fast Moore's Law would allow increases in the computation speed. And so we figured that over until 2012, we'd get a 13-factor increase in computation speed. That's about 22% a year. And then we predicted that there'd be a knee in the curve. This is based on the National Semiconductor Roadmap, which said all these things laid it out there. So 7% and a half percent faster every year thereafter for another 5x. So we figured 70, 64, 65 uh, speed up by the year 2034. That was our model of, of Moore's Law. So it didn't, uh, it just took into account basic uh, speeds. It, it, it didn't uh, take into account investment in ASICs or things like that, which, which are maybe a more important factor. 
Uh, so the first year on this model, we'd get 94 billion squarings, and then total squarings were 79 trillion, 685 billion, 186 million, 856, 1,218, which is T, right? So that's about 80 trillion. So that was the puzzle that we, we posted, and it got ignored and forgotten pretty much for a while until you guys picked it up on it. Um, so it was, it was posted. And I wonder if I can do this one. Okay, there we go. So we had uh, the time capsule sealed. Bill Gates put in an uh, original copy of the Altair Basic thing, which he's famous for, and uh, uh, many people, members of the lab put in, in things as well. So we sealed up the capsule and, and started the puzzle. Then, uh, amazingly, just last month, there was solutions. You guys came up with surprising to me solutions. I didn't realize anybody had been working on this problem. And so Bernard finished first, and he wrote to the director of the lab and well, tried to find who the lab was, because it's no longer the lab for computer science. It's the, now the computer science and AI laboratory. So he eventually sent an email that eventually found its way to me. And I said, yes, this is important. And we, we, need to, we need to celebrate this. So. Here's uh, Bernard's uh, solution. He talked, you talked about this on Wednesday. I, I, maybe you have more details today to tell people uh, uh, what you did, but it uh, was solved on April 15th, which is almost exactly 20 years after the puzzle was posted. The, the party was in April of 1999, so this is 20 years later. Um, he sent us an email on this April 16th last month. Uh, it was a software-based approach using GMP, uh, very carefully optimized in a number of ways. But still, it took three years and three months of computation on his desktop. Um, but he finished it first on April, 6th, April 15th. Um, and he got the secret message that we'd embedded, which was, happy birthday, LCS. LCS didn't exist anymore, but happy birthday, LCS. And some numeric values that allow you to confirm that you've got the right value. Of course, once you get the message, it's sort of obvious you've got the right value. Making sure you don't have errors along the way, of course, is an important part of this. And I know Juan's been working on on a different approach to that based on something we suggested in the paper, and, and Simon was doing recomputing things and so on too, and, and, and Bernard as well. So making sure you don't mess up along the sequential computation is an important part. So that was the first solution, which was itself a surprise, a wonderful thing to see, and cause for all of the activities we're having. But then uh, there was a second solution, which uh, Simon and team, the supranational uh, group, uh, Samanchi group, is Heritage here? Yeah, they're Heritage, yeah. And, uh, Justin, Justin's where Justin's talking second, so he's going to be here. And then protocol laboratory is Jeremy here too. He had to go home. He had to go home. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, so great team, and more than you four, I think there's other people involved as well. So, but uh, pulled it, pulled together a FPGA design, uh, which solved it on May 10th. But they wrote us email on April 17th, which is one day after we got Bernard's email. This is an astonishing coincidence, right? Like one day after we get the email from from uh, Bernard, we, uh, we get an email from, from uh, Simon and crew saying they're about to solve it, we should know about it, well, let's, let's have a, a, an event like this. Uh, uh, and uh, so I said, uh, well, Simon, you've been scooped. <laughs> you know, and, and so Bernard got it first, but congratulations, and, and let's, let's, let's do this. So it's an FBG approach, and it was much faster, it took two months of computation. Um, and, and so that was the second solution. And there may be more solutions coming along the way. As, 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 as. So uh, on, on Wednesday, we had the event. We had uh, some awards, uh, presentations by Bernard and Simon, just about some food. And, and uh, we opened the time capsule, put new things back into the time capsule, uh, had, had some, um, uh, some party, and, and that was that. So then, and then today is some more technical kind of talk about things about verifiable delay functions. So uh, I just wanted to introduce them with uh, a few remarks about the history of the context, and I'm looking forward very much to hearing all the talks about the technical details of how you're, you're thinking about applications for VDF and designs of VDFs and speed ups. There is a new puzzle that we finished uh, and, and published on Wednesday. So uh, uh, Danielle Roos said, Ron, OK, the, these guys found the solution 20 years instead of 35 years. Please come up with a 15-year puzzle now to, fin to finish off the gap. And, and so um, there is, there's one published. You guys can start working on it. Don't solve it this week, please. Um, uh, but it, it's a 3072-bit uh, modulus instead of a 24-bit modulus. And the, the number of squarings is like 2 to the 56th, which is like 1,000 times more than the T for the earlier puzzle. Um, still, I worry that you guys might solve it early if you're. Is that published online yet? 
Pardon? Is that published online yet? It's on, um, it was, there were paper copies handed out. I don't know if they put it on. There's supposed to be a website for all of this that's happening. So I, I don't know if it's happened. If you send me an email, I can send you the, the there's, a, there's a document I have, which I can, uh, or maybe if there's a mailing, I don't know if there's a mailing list for this group. But, but um, yeah, there's just, it's just the number N, and then the number T is 2 to the 56. So it's, 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 I, I have to get the N. And there's the message, I guess, too, the ciphertext. So that's all I had to say. And I guess uh, Justin is up next.